Welcome everyone to Melfuzz TV, I am Peter and today I'm going to be talking about Fallout Season 1 Episode 3, it's called The Head. So spoilers for the episode, and I like this one a lot, I, I think this was a great little advancement for Maximus's story, I think obviously it revealed a lot about the ghoul, right, about <laughs> his backstory and tying that into sort of like a, a prominent thing in Fallout history because as I understand it, this is technically still canon with the video games, because they're all set in very different time periods uh, all over the country. So it's very interesting that this is actually kind of like doing the origin of the the Vault Boy, or the, the Pip Boy, or whatever you want to call him, and even the Thumbs Up, which obviously when we were introduced to the ghoul in the flashback at the start of episode one, he, you know, he explained the whole thumb idea, that if you put your thumb out and you see the explosion, and I think the end of this episode kind of calls into question, like, how true that is, if it's just something... Because it's not like he, he does the thumb up in the photo shoot at the end of this episode because of that, necessarily. Maybe he'll mention that later, but it, it kind of made me think that, oh, like, the, either he just already knew that and it wasn't something they were actively promoting, or he just had the idea for the thumb and it then... They gave it meaning later on as to why the 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 vault boy always has the thumb out and the the main poses. And this was a great bookend to the episode. Um, it, it contrasts especially with how mean and cruel spirited the ghoul is in the main timeline of the show. Uh, particularly when he's pouring water out in front of Lucy instead of giving her a drink when she wants one. Uh, and of course he is clearly triggered by his past because he shoots the, the billboard with the vault boy on it because it's making him think of this and the idea that he was the original vault boy as an actor, he was enlisted by his wife who seems to work for vault tech, that's kind of what the, the flashbacks in this episode suggest and she roped him into it and he was happy to do so uh, and they even made the, the, the outfit, the vault suits in his colour scheme because it's the colour scheme he had as a, as a cowboy. In fact, speaking of, the episode starts, the flashback starts with him shooting a scene from his movie, and it's really pointing out how different he is in the, the wasteland versus back in real life, because in real life, he actually has a problem with his character killing the bad guy. He says, hey, I'm supposed to be the sheriff, I'm supposed to be a hero, What? why am I doing this? And the director's getting frustrated, <laughs> because no, no, this is, this is about the new age, this is about the, the strength of the individual, over the whole and doing what needs to be done and and so on and it makes this a little speech to him and it really does contrast who he is now versus who he was in the past so later in the episode when he says to Lucy like nothing stays clean up here he's talking about the water but he's really talking about her and in this case himself because <laughs> that's how I'm leaning into it he's talking about how people change in the wasteland and you lose your innocence and Lucy's whole thing in this show so far, she was in this coddled environment that believed in all these values and was not prepared for the real world on the outside. Which you could just sort of read as a, a coming of age thing more than anything else. Like you, you're coddled as, a, as an adolescent, as a child, and then you're unleashed into the world and oh no, it's bigger and scarier than maybe you were prepared for. Uh, this just amplifies that tenfold because you're in this coddled vault environment and then put into this really nasty version of the world on the outside. So I, I thought that was all done really well. Um, I find him a very entertaining character and sort of seeing how this then sort of ties into the overall mythology of the Fallout world that they're building with this show, I think is really fun. It instantly made the character feel like, okay, he's not just a fun, cool character that's interesting to watch. He also has a very interesting backstory that's going to flesh out this world in a meaningful way. It already feels a little bit like that by the time I got to the end of this episode. It was, okay, he actually has ties to the creation of, not the world per se, but he has ties to a lot of the things that are in it. And probably the greedy capitalists that were vault tech building these vaults. Like, they don't say too much in this episode, but I get the impression we're going to find out. Maybe... Assuming his marriage did fall apart, they seem quite loving in this episode. And to be fair, in that first episode, it was only the guess of the other people that he had was needing to pay alimony. Maybe they knew that he was separated, so it was like an educated guess. But if they do separate, if him and his wife do split up when they seem so happy right now, maybe it's because they clash over the the morals or the whatever you know Vault Tech is doing. 
which maybe makes the end of this episode a little bit of like a he he actually does a little speech before he does the photo shoot where he's talking about how you're doing the god's work and you're protecting everyone and like all this stuff you're doing to hopefully ensure everyone's survival is is genuine and he sort of praises them in a sort of wholesome way and I wonder if he later discovers that they're just a bunch of, bunch of money grabbing assholes. <laughs> like he even says, "Will this suit really protect you against radiation?" And they kind of hesitate, but then go, "Yeah, absolutely." Coop. It's funny. I, I don't know if I, I caught his full name before. I guess we must have done because this didn't feel like a reveal that Coop. I presume is short for Cooper, and that's one of his names. But regardless, I'm just going to keep calling him the Ghoul. It's easy to remember. All that, really interesting. Super, super love those scenes. Uh, and I'll, I'll delve into Lucy next, uh, who I think out of the three leads is probably the one that I'm like the least enthusiastic about. But that's not to say that I don't think she's added anything to the show. I think all of the character stories kind of neatly, thematically sit next to each other because of you know what I'm talking about. I, I think I said a few times last episode that I see a lot of parallels with her and Maximus's story uh, even though they're f- coming from different groups, them having this coming of age of realizing what it's actually like to be out here in the wasteland does seem to kind of parallel in a lot of ways. And I think in this episode, you know, obviously you've got the dark humor of her walking about with the head, and that head gets passed around a lot of this episode. But by the end of the episode, it's Maximus that's got it. Uh, obviously, it starts off with Lucy, the gulper, the monster's got it, which, you know, is probably the big set piece of this episode is the fun with the monster. Uh, and it is fun. It's it's a great. There's, there's there's a couple of practical looking moments actually when there's like close ups of Lucy being grabbed when she arrives at this underwater town. She she managed to get away, although it's chewed off her boot. But it's got it's got the head. The the gulper's got the head, and this is where uh, the girl kind of intersects with her story. Um, if I have a, it's not even a critique per se because it's not. In fact, it's a sort of thing where I think in the moment I was a little annoyed that. When he ties her up and he dunks her in the water and she's like asking, oh, torturing is is cruel and blah, blah, blah. And they have a whole conversation where he talks about how back in the old days they used to do studies and they, they said that torturing never actually achieved anything. It was just a cruelty. Uh, and eventually it builds up to the end point of the conversation, which is, I, th- I think I was a little annoyed in the scene initially because I thought it's painfully obvious here that he's not torturing her. He's using her as bait. And sure enough, at the end of the conversation, he says, I'm not torturing you. I'm using you as bait. But upon reflection, I actually kind of like it because it sells how naive she is. Uh, I do appreciate that she tries to look for the best in people. She tries to ask people to be kind. She tries to... And maybe part of the story is that Maybe the girl will learn some kindness from her. Maybe that's going to be the the irony of his story is that he ends up suffering because of her if that's the route they go down. Maybe he even remembers what it's like to be a father figure in some capacity. I don't know. I don't know if that's where they're going with his character. I really don't. But I could see them potentially going down that path and maybe this is the start of that story. Assuming the girl and Lucy stick together for a lot of the rest of the show. And I don't know if they will because we've already had these three main characters in the same scene together then split up again. I could see them splitting up again and reuniting down the line. Like, all very possible. But ultimately, uh, one of the big things with the ghoul here is that he's taking this, like, serum that keeps him... They've not explained it too in-depth. Obviously, he got some when he first woke up. It seems like it keeps him awake, or at the very least keeps him from losing his... uh, coherence like maybe he does just turn into kind of a zombie if he doesn't keep taking this stuff and he's very upset that this the the rest of his supply gets smashed when he's dealing with the monster uh, and that's kind of where we leave off with that stuff but all the stuff with the monster going about was fun obviously there's a little bit more of it when maximus and his new uh, squire uh show up which uh, thaddeus is his name the the comms and his suit start talking to him it's like hq and they're like hey report in you've not reported in so he tries to do a voice and says that his squire died heroically in combat. And like, okay, we'll send you a new one. And he's like, no, 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 no. He's like, no, we need to send you a new one. And he rips out the comms, but that set things up already. But there's a part of the suit that got damaged in the fight with the ghoul. So he takes this little piece and he goes back into the town to try and get it fixed. And there's a little bit of humor here where he tries to get it fixed and the, the girl's like, I can do it for five bottle caps. 
and then he goes and sells a tooth to get some more bottle caps so he can afford it. And we do a whole thing here when he gets back to the, the suit, there's a group of thugs or whoever trying to steal it and like play with it. And when he tries to get them to go, they just beat the shit out of him. And I really like the, what comes next in this, this scene because it does this thing where, you know, I was talking a lot last episode about him facing the harsh reality of who he actually is once he doesn't have the magic power armor to protect him. And I think this scene did a good job of playing with that a little bit where he has this moment after he gets beat up a little bit where he grabs like a like it's like a tire iron type thing, like a bar of some kind. And he looks pissed and he's coming towards them. The music's ramping up and it plays like, oh, he's about to F them up. Like he's finally like lost it. He's finally frustrated. Obviously being beat up again reminds him of being beat up in the camp before with the bullies. He's gonna go shit go ape shit and like completely take them out. And he like hits a couple of them, right, with the bar, and it's it's fine. But then he gets overwhelmed because there's too many of them and he still gets the shit kind of beat out of them. Like they, they just keep effing him up. And it's only because eventually he gets his hand inside the, the inside the arm of the power armor that he then crushes the head. And a wonderful gore effect, might I add, but he crushes the head of one of the bad guys and that sends the rest of them running away. But like he basically had to crawl back to the magic armor to win this fight. And I, obviously it's not literally magic. I'm saying it's magic in the context of like giving him this like extra ability and the confidence that he now has with it this with it so i, I thought that scene did a great job of like challenging how, mu how much of a of a good man or a heroic man he is outside that armor and he kind of tries to think he is but then <laughs> the, the reality comes tumbling down on him uh and he has to retreat to it as quickly as he can to to maintain anything uh, and then after this is when Thaddeus, who was the main bully who was beating him up back at the camp, shows up as the new squire. So he runs back to the armor, he's inside it, and interestingly, I pointed out last episode the whole thing of the 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 knight, if you want to call him that, the the Brotherhood of Steel dude, uh, ripped off the cod piece and told Maximus to clean it. And sure enough, in this, there's a little bit of build up to it because uh, there's a moment where. Uh, Thaddeus thinks that he's pissed them off and he's down on his knees begging for forgiveness and it's almost like by the end of this Maximus is kind of smiling a little bit he's realizing that he's got power over his former bully and he then takes off his cod piece and he hands it to him and says clean it and this moment like I thought was such a good little bit of storytelling because it tell I mean I already said this last episode but this makes it explicit in the show it's telling you that the whole idea of the Brotherhood of Steel is is that you sort of go up the ranks and then you treat whoever's below you as badly as the person did to you before. Immediately that became clear with this cod piece moment. Now, I mean, obviously it's happened much quicker for Maximus than it's supposed to. He's kind of shot himself up the rank, uh, like out of the, the normal parameters, but he's shot up to that next level and now he's handing the cod piece to someone else is a... Uh, is a move to say I'm in charge, right? And you obey me. I'm the one who's calling the shots and you are my bitch, effectively. That's what this moment is. You know, it's one of those things where I'm, I'm thinking about post-apocalyptic shows and this idea that some people, after the, the fallout, if you will, not to use the name of the show, but after the fallout of the of the atomic war and like the once the dust is settling, and society's been completely destabilized, this idea that some people would retreat to something with a sense of order. In fact, I just... Uh, the episode's not out yet. It won't be out for another uh, month or something like that. But I just recorded a review for Mad Max Fury Road, and one of the things that I was talking about in that with my co-host, David, is that the reason why a lot of the young men in that movie worship and and obey the bad guy immortum joe is because in the wasteland and this idea of the, like no, there's no structure to anything everyone's fending from themselves this sort of like fascist like dictator leader does at least offer some sense of structure and security that is not being offered anywhere else and i feel that like the brotherhood is still at least from what i've got at the show so far feels like oh this sort of like ultra masculine cult is kind of formed to give give people this sense of power, like they're in charge, like they can control things. 
and all the worst parts of masculinity have just been funneled into it. And that gets further throughout the episode when ultimately Thaddeus is asked by uh, Maxim, after he messes around with them claiming a tree for a bit, which is quite funny, he's like, hey, talk about the previous squire. You knew him? Right, talk about him. So he's asking Thaddeus to talk about Maximus, talk about himself without him knowing that he's talking directly to Maximus. And he says he was a nice guy. He's like, say something negative about him. And I thought that was really interesting that he said that because he's expecting something negative. So when Thaddeus actually says something bordering on nice, he's like taken aback by it. He doesn't know how to process that. He hates Thaddeus for what he's done to him. So Thaddeus kind of opens up and says, well, to be honest, like me and the other guys gave him a hard time. We beat the shit out of him. But I only did that because when I first arrived at the camp, people beat the shit out of me. So when I saw a new person arrive, I said, this beat him up and I became popular. And it was kind of like, even in the camp, this idea of like doing your time as the run, as the one who gets abused, you then level up to be the abuser and then you keep going up the chain. Even in the camp, it's like that. So everything I was thinking earlier on with the cod piece, this conversation just reinforced all of it, which is this idea that this entire system and the Brotherhood of Steel is kind of built on this. And maybe the story of this, these characters in some ways could be to learn, uh, like, that's what's happening to them. But yeah, I, I think it's like, what, what the, the themes of this show so far to me very much center around the idea of the illusion of structure and control and what these different end of, these different groups, whether it be the vaults or the Brotherhood of Steel, are doing to try and sort of evoke certain things out of the people that follow under those regimes or under those structures. It, it's kind of like pointing how certain groups go to the worst aspects of humanity when left to try and make sense out of a harsh world. So I, I like I, I, I really enjoyed all the scenes with Maximus and Thaddeus in this episode. Uh, I, I think everything that they said to each other just kind of furthered all the central themes that the characters had kind of brought up. There's several times where Maximus is smiling under his armor because he's been a dick to uh, <laughs> to Thaddeus. But by the end of the episode, he ends up saving... Th in fact, Thaddeus saves him first. When they get to the gulper, there's a great big slow motion shot of the gulper jumping out of the water at uh, Maximus in the armor. And it's actually Thaddeus like firing off a big like uh, harpoon or whatever it is that saves him. And then... Maximus saves him by pulling him out of the, the gulper's mouth. I actually wasn't sure how the gulper died. You can see his eyes kind of dilate, like he's realizing that he's bitten to something bad or that he's poisoned. I wonder if the harpoon was just poisoned or something, uh, but he just kind of dies eventually and they, he pulls him out of the mouth. Uh, and the design on this gulper was great, by the way. All the little tendrils on the tongue. Uh, it was like fingers, almost. That's how big they were. Oh, it was disgusting in the best possible way. But, yeah, it's almost like they've inadvertently got to this realisation that if they look out for each other <laughs> and care about each other, then that's a much more healthy relationship than everything they'd been doing in the Brotherhood of Steel up until this point. Like, they're taught to be subservient. Like, Thaddeus, as soon as he shows up, is down in one dean. I, I bow before you. I will serve you whoever you see fit, Master. That's what he's been taught to do to the knights. That's how he's been taught to act. And the expectation is that one day if he's a knight, someone else will do that for him. And that's the entire system. But at some point, someone has to break it and say, maybe, maybe we just show kindness to the next person in line rather than treat them like shit just because I got treated like shit. There's no reason to have to pass on cruelty forward, which is, you know, obviously a problem in the, in the real world. Anytime you talk about improving anything, There'll, there'll no doubt be someone who's a bit older saying, well, I had to do this, so you should have to do it too. You know, I think that this, this, these characters in this storyline are really kind of try to get at that. And uh, I think it's super fascinating because of that. So, uh, yeah. But anyway, the monster spits out the head at the end of the episode. So they've got the head. They even do a little uh, hooray dance as we cut away from them. But, yeah. R Really good stuff. I, I, I really enjoyed this episode. It's not as bombastic as episode two, because episode two had the big, you know, culmination in the town where they all were there together and there was a big fight. And you had the monster stuff, which was really fun and looked great. But for me, this was an episode where it really started to 
clot the themes of the characters. Although there's one little subplot that I've not talked about yet. Uh, and that is the vault. We go back to uh, Lucy's brother. What's his name here? Uh, Norm. And he is in trouble, as as is Lucy's cousin, who she was having sex with, uh, for letting her out. And the council try to punish him, but they can't really punish him because the punishment usually is, we'll demote him to a job that no one wants in the vault. But he's done all the jobs that no one wants and has had a bad review every time because he lacks enthusiasm. Um, so he's given the job of like bringing the food to the prisoners, yeah, whoever's left over from the, the raiders who are killing them. They've got them locked up in one of the rooms. So we get a little sense of that, and they're acting like animals. They're throwing food at the windows. They're you know saying they're going to eat <laughs> uh, the, the vault dwellers if they ever get out, things like that. Uh, but this leads to another scene later where there's like a town meeting and they're d- discussing what to do with the prisoners. What do we do? And they're ultra positive. They're ultra positive in this really kind of sort of naive way where like, this is an opportunity to to teach some some ruffians like how civilized people are. And we're going to, it'll take decades maybe, but we're going to like rehabilitate them. Ultimately, like we, we like they start up suggesting absurd things, like you know the old guys, like oh I'll 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 teach them Shakespeare, <laughs> and someone else is oh I'll, I'll teach them trigonometry, and they're, they're having this debate, and eventually Norm lets out this like sigh or he rolls his eyes, and the the doofuses running the meeting are like hey Norm have you got something to suggest, and he's like well. I think we should do to them what they were going to do to us. And everyone gasps and they're like, oh no, okay, that, that's a bit. And the one person who kind of like is taking this in is the pregnant woman who's now got an eye patch on because you get stabbed in the eye, whose husband was killed in this whole incident. And she's like, you know what? I I, I, I think you're right. I think if your dad was here, we'd be doing, doing what needs to be done. So this idea that even just this incident has infected the ultra goody two-shoes vault into possibly doing something really... And this is the thing, I, obviously, it's very easy to look at the Vault Dwellers and say they're very naive about how they think they're going to save the world. They're kind of got their head up their own ass a little bit, all that stuff. But fundamentally, there is something to be said about them not just murdering people, and maybe technically, while I can see the argument for just doing it, especially since they don't have enough supplies for them, because uh, the other funny thing that happens in this scene is that a guy comes out and says, "Hey, uh, people in charge, uh, we, we got uh, we got a problem." And they're like, "Oh, just tell it in front of everyone. We're we're not like the old regime. We will have open discussions." Is it okay? Yeah. Well, the water thing's broken. We only have enough water for two months, <laughs> so that's obviously something we're going to have to deal with. And I, I do wonder if we're going to see society completely break down in the vault. Um, and this idea that it's the outside that's the problem, I mean, it's still kind of true because it was influence from the outside that started all this. I wonder if it's going to show that, you know, societies can break down no matter what. Like, the, there could be backstabbing in the vault, there could be, like, like grafts for power and things like that down there, uh, even without the influence of the outside. I don't know. I'm curious to see where that stuff goes. I was very surprised when it just cut back to them. I, I thought we weren't going to see them again until Lucy went back at some point, if she ever goes back, that is, I suppose. But uh, super interesting. Uh, but yeah, this idea of like being out in the wasteland will change you. And I think we're already seeing evidence of that with Maximus, who may even be coming a, a, a better person, as is Thaddeus, perhaps. And then Lucy, I think, is maybe like having actually suffered some cruelty at the hands of the ghoul. Uh, I, I don't know if they're eventually going to bond and he is going to like actually look out for her, or if he is going to remain just as you know, as much of a dick as he is. Um, it really it really could go in a couple of different directions depending on where the ultimate story with her is going. Either way, the, the core theme of, like, her being met with this harsh world and, uh, like, her, her naive views and shelter views being altered, being changed, uh, you know, and even that kind of ties into this idea of, like, in the past, Walton Goggins' character, the ghoul, or you know, who he was before the ghoul, was this naive guy who tried to cling to good values, who tried to be a beacon of good things, and ultimately, maybe, if, if I'm right in assuming that vault Tech are kind of scummy about everything, <laughs> then maybe is going to get disillusioned in some way, and like all the good things he believed in never rewarded him, effectively. But we'll see, we'll see how that goes. I, 
very fascinating. Uh, loving the show. Looking forward to watching episode four, which I do plan to get to quite quickly. Um, I'm hoping at the very least that I'll get another two episodes done this week. Um, so we'll just have uh, two or three next week. But that is the plan. So thank you very much for joining me. Let me know what you thought of this episode in the comments. Like, subscribe, all that stuff. Helps out a bunch if you do. Uh, you can go over to patreon.com slash TV and help keep all the content coming. Keep the lights on, all that stuff. So thank you very much for joining me. I always appreciate it. Keep watching TV. Have you got any vanilla?